Welcome back to the channel, guys. This is Parker with Backyard Barn Finds, and today we have something special planned for you. We're gonna go and take a look at the McCandless collection, and inside waiting for us is Mike, the son of Herb McCandless, and we'll go see what he has in store for us right now. Mike, how are you? Hey, good, man. Nice to meet you. Awesome, awesome. So where, where did you want to start? Ah, uh, well, the easiest place to start is at number one, right? Sure. So number one right here is this 1955 Chrysler 300. Uh, at first glance, obviously, it looks like a race car. It's all painted up, and that's because it actually is a race car. It was the first Chrysler 300 ever built, serial number one. Uh, as far as all the cars in the collection, this is by far the standout car of the collection. It was taken, it was built early, VIN 1 and VIN 2 were built uh, ahead of time, sent to Daytona to race in the big Daytona race that was done on the beach uh, and through the streets. And this car ended up winning the women's time trial division, it finished second in the men's time trial division, uh, and then ultimately finished second in the big race behind VIN number 2. And so I believe this to be probably the most historically significant Chrysler 300 that exists. There's a lot of one-off things because it's essentially a prototype car. And uh, many years and lots of money and lots of research, we've been able to gather just tons and tons of racing history on the car. So it's a, it's a fantastic piece. I debuted it at McCacken uh, where it came out with a, a perfect score upon initial judging. And then she's been back here. So. Where, where did you find this car? How did you acquire this car? There was a collector named Josh Ackerman, great guy, uh, very big into history, and he would look up just all this data on stuff. He knew the car, found it, started gathering the history, had the car actually running, but in my opinion, the car needed a full restoration, and he was able to work with me. We were able to get a deal done, not only on this car, but another car I'll show you in just a little bit. And we took the information he had already gathered took it a step further and you know got even more more history on it so um, speaking of other serial number ones so this is also the first ever uh, Chrysler 300 that was built it's a uh, serial number one from 1957 so serial number 1001 uh, lots of unique features on this car as well with the bucket seats which were not this was the only 300 that was built that way the rest of them ended up coming with bench seats this car was really built for Key Keffer who was the big Chrysler race guy down at Daytona and he had a huge racing program and he actually got this car early, drove it all around Daytona. If you see any advertisements for a 1957 Chrysler uh, convertible for 57, this is the car that they actually used. And they did some really cool stuff because they were running this car on the beach at high speeds. And so they did this really goofy dual uh, hood latch that you see, you see the spring there and the spring there. Yeah. That was done because they weren't really sure how the car was gonna react. Uh, on the beach going at high speed. So yeah, really, really neat car. Uh, one of the other headliners of the collection. I do have one other serial number one car that's under restoration right now, which is a 1958 Chrysler 300D. It was the first fuel injected car that they ever built. And we have all the original fuel injection components. And I hope to have that car done uh, later this year. It's being done by Whitehall Restorations up in Massachusetts. So uh, this is the lowest mileage uh, 58 Chrysler New Yorker convertible. I would argue it's probably the most highly restored uh, one that's out there. Very low production, very few surviving. Probably less than a dozen of these at this point uh, that are actually restored cars. There's only about 5,000 miles uh, on the car. So super neat. I'm obviously big into everything in the 50s. So every car that you kind of see around here, that's the, uh, you know, that's always what I'm going for. Well, I heard a story that your dad used to kind of steal his uncle's Chrysler 300 or something? <laughs> yeah, or? yeah, dad, uh, yeah, dad back in the day, uh, his uncle, I believe he was a 300F is what he had, which actually if you spin around, you'll see one of those. I have it in the middle of the alleyway right now, uh, as you can see the lift right here, which means we're getting ready to do some surgery on the walls. Uh, this wall is getting ready to get some rearranging, so we moved the car out of the way, and uh, we have a neon that'll be going up on this wall soon, so got to got to get prepared for that. Just got to get the fork truck over here and and get running on it. And you guys have a, a world-class sign collection, not only the cars, but I mean, and that's that's kind of just something that you don't see ev every day. 
Yeah, you know, it's very specific. Uh, everything in here is, with the exception of just very few pieces, is pre-1962. So that's what I like to focus on and then go backwards. Basically, the easiest way to describe it is if it has a pin star on it, which is kind of iconic to Mopar, I don't have it. That generally started in mid-64. But for me, I felt like it, the sign should represent the era of the cars that are here, which might be confusing because you can look around here and see, obviously, muscle cars. And <laughs> all of the cars that are lettered up in the Sox and Martin or the Mr. Four Speed were either original cars that my father raced and then I've gone back and restored, or like in the case of this Duster, uh, this is a clone of the real car. Uh, the real car burned in a towing accident uh, and does not exist. That's so the 70 one, right? That's the 70 one, yep, the 70 Duster. So this is the one I usually take out when going to events because I don't have the concerns about if somebody were to lean against the car. You know, this is an all metal car, which is nice, whereas a lot of the race cars in 68 up through about 72, a lot of those cars were acid dipped. And if they retain any of that original metal, it's hyper thin. And if somebody were to lean on it or do anything like that, it could actually damage the car. And the one that's acid dipped is the one that's over over there, the 72. Correct. Yep, yep. Yeah. That whole car is uh, has been totally acid dipped and is, everything was lightened on it. I love the car because my dad is my dad's favorite car. I also hate the car because just moving it, touching it, anything is, is always a bit of a handful. So I prefer for it to stay here uh, just so I don't have the concerns of moving it around. We'll navigate around this yeah. one. Yeah, they only made three of these in this color, this 300F. It's a sunburst yellow. Uh, I got it on rollers right now, so we, like I said, we could move everything out of the way. The F and the G, the F was made in 60 and the G was made in 61. And they look like they're kind of similar cars, but literally nothing transfers over on them. But they're sort of iconic and known for these long rams, this you know, 413, very powerful engine uh, for the time and just a, an iconic look within the engine compartment. I actually prefer this era of car to keep the hood down, to let the styling lines sort of lead out. But with this engine in particular, uh, it's a hood open type car. You know, if we take it out and drive it around, go to a local cruise in, this is definitely one we'll, uh, you know, pop the hood on. So, but it's very similar initially in styling to the 61 as well. Like I said, the, the tail fins look similar. A lot of things look similar on the cars, but literally nothing transfers. And that's what makes a lot of these cars difficult to restore. There's very little crossover between models. Uh, there's no reproduction parts. So a lot of times when you're doing these restorations, you have to have another car to help you, a good parts car to assist you with getting the restoration done. And that's why you don't see a lot of these out because they are incredibly difficult to restore. And they're rare. They didn't make that many letter cars. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, definitely a rare car. Uh, this is my dad's, probably one of my dad's favorites. It's a 59 DeSoto Fire Dome. I'm very partial to DeSotos. Uh, they're sort of my favorite design as far as styling, wild tail lights, lots of chrome. And Fire Dome was really kind of like a mid-model. Uh, they had four models of DeSotos in that time period with Adventure being the, the top of the line. And when you spin around, you'll see uh, an Adventure here. So there's only 12 of these that exist at this point uh, that are restored or are known, but they only made uh, around 97 of them in total. So extremely, extremely rare car. This is by far my favorite. I love the, anything with adventure generally meant gold. So it's, you know, in this case it's black and gold, but it could also be white and gold or it could be gold and black, but it always had gold in it. And it has this crazy gold flake carpet, gold interior. I mean, it's just, it's almost borderline obnoxious, which is why it's so awesome. Uh, it's the peak. It kind of looks like a Rolls Royce starlight pattern on the roof. But, but <laughs> right, it's on, but you got it's on, it on the it's floor. It's on the carpet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is 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 probably uh, you know my favorite, and you'll see a couple of other uh, 59 DeSoto convertibles as we you know make the round here. And so this would be another setup they would do with the white and the gold, and you know it's a two four setup. Like these things had significant motors in them while. They're tanks. I mean, these cars are extremely heavy, uh, huge X frames underneath them. Uh, they had to have a lot of power just to literally get themselves, you know, sorted through traffic. And right now we've got these here towards the end because once summer gets here, a lot of these cars will move out. We'll rotate in different cars. There's about 50 cars in the collection in total. So there's always something different in here, but we try to put miles actually on the cars. Um, that's the sign that's going on the wall, uh, the neon that's plugged in right there. That's what uh, we were 
putting the lift over there for. That's the next piece to go up. And there's all types of, you know, just kind of unique, cool stuff. People come over here and go, oh, look at the pedal cars. And it's like, well, only the top row is pedal cars. The middle row are actually electric cars. And on the bottom, those are actually two horsepower Briggs powered uh, DeSoto Fire Mites. And oddly, those things now are worth as much as some of the cars that I actually have because they're extreme. They were very fragile. Most of them got destroyed. Um, so there's only single digits of those that exist at this point. And you got the big boats, the Imperials, which was the, the peak of Chrysler luxury at the time. So absolutely gigantic, you know, heavy cars. You know, they had the 413 in 59. And uh, this one, we haven't really had out that much. It'll be going out this summer to get some miles on it, make sure everything is sorted. All the cars in here run, drive. Uh, some of them we don't really move, like VIN 1 is going to you know, sort of stay stationary where it's at. Can you tell me about that sign? Because I don't, <laughs> I don't think I've, I've seen one that big before. <laughs> I pulled that out of the original dealer uh, in, Lynchburg, really? yeah, in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, it was a consignment store now that had no air conditioning. I pulled it out in the summer two years ago, and it had warped itself really bad. It had twisted itself almost off the wall. And the uh, tallest part of it was about 14 feet in the air. So we doubled up some scaffolding, and you can see the cut lines. I actually had to cut it. Uh, into pieces to be able to get it down. And then we brought it back here, reconstructed it, uh, you know, so it could take up the wall. I just, I love stuff like that. It was, the lady was very happy for me to get it out and I was very happy to have it. So it worked great. Um, I'll show you two really cool cars. This, I'm a station wagon nut. A lot of stuff that's in my personal collection at home are station wagons. Uh, so this is a 59 Fireflight station wagon. This is the most premium model highly optioned out i would argue it's probably the best one in the country as far as uh, desoto station wagons as far as restoration level and everything just absolutely a nutball car just beautiful interior beautiful gauges lots of chrome everywhere and like at that time rack. you could get what was called adventure powered which meant you would get the engine and this was a 59 only situation uh, you would get the engine that was in one of these cars up here. So the big luxury convertible, you could get that engine into a station wagon. So if you wanted to haul the kids very fast. The seat uh, in the back is... <laughs> yeah, the rear facing back seat. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty sweet. And if you spin around here, this car is the other one I got from Josh, the guy that owned uh, VIN number one. They only made two factory stick cars in uh, 1958 for the Chrysler 300D. And this is one of those two. This car is in original condition. It was raced at the Bonneville Salt Flats, uh, set a couple of class records and all that type of stuff. Interior's original, paint's original. You will see the discoloration here where it's like, hey, this has obviously had a repaint, but we have pictures of it at Bonneville uh, when they were racing it. And you can see like here, that's two different colors. It's because when they ran at El Mirage, they kind of beat up the front end with rocks and everything. So they repainted it before they went to Bonneville. But my favorite picture is this. I don't know how they loaded it and I don't know how they unloaded it, but I would love to see a video of that. Um, but it's really cool. We have all the, uh, the record uh, badges from when they went, uh, the 141 in it. So we have all that in our historical records. And, uh, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just super cool. Norm Thatcher was the man. He would race anything. And there's all types of nutty pictures of him racing stuff that I wouldn't be caught driving around the parking lot in, much less trying to go hundreds of miles an hour down the street. So, and one thing that's really cool about doing this, like you see that huge billboard, I got contacted after I posted a video of it online. There's a countertop display back there in the back that was made to sit uh, probably like in a theater or something like that. And it actually highlights the John P. Hughes Motor Company, which is the same as the, the one up there. And that would rotate and it would have like a frigid air advertisement, a local movie advertisement. So I love being able to combine the history you know, of things together. One of my favorite signs in the collection is, <laughs> is this one right here. Yeah, Smaltz is uh, really cool. So it's like crushed glass that's used. Uh, it's, it's delicate. You can't really clean it. So however you see it is just how it is. And this is in the original crate and you can see some of the wording is originally meant to go to Suffolk, Virginia. Um, I, I love being able to, to find items that are, 
you know, this original, being able to have something in the original crate is just super freaking cool. It's just not something that you find. Super uh, rare. Right we yeah. Have, we have a few of them at home and super, super rare. Yeah. Sign. And I love smalts. I think smalts is really cool because you have light really shine on it, uh, like headlights, it, it would reflect. So it's pretty cool. Uh, this is one of the rarest cars actually in the museum. There's about five or six of these that are known to exist. This is the only one that ever gets driven. The others are highly restored uh, cars. So this is the 58 Adventure Convertibles. They only built around 82 of them. And it has one of the goofiest features that you'll ever see in a car, which is in the exhaust. So they decided for some unknown reason that it was a good idea to run the exhaust down, up and through and out the taillight bezel of the car. So that's actually where the exhaust exits out. So in 58, you can, one way you can always tell the difference between the different year models, 58 has this little curvature right here. A 57 Adventure, it's flat, so it looks more like a, a flat oval that runs across there. But they run them out the taillight bezels. In 59, they realized that was a dumb idea, so they actually ran it out like a normal exhaust. When you were saying crazy option, I, is that a kid's seat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just threw that in there because uh, I don't think a lot of people understand the way, like the newer generation, let's say anybody under the age of 40 has no idea that that's actually how kids were restrained, if they were restrained at all. I mean, most people, when they come in here and they see the station wagons and stuff like that, they always tell you, I remember when I was a kid and I was looking out the back glass and, you know, that's how it was. And kids set up on the, the area in the back of, you know, two and four door hardtops. That's just the way it was. Like parents, they would freak out if you were like, yeah, that's our car seat. So I love having that in there. It gets a lot of attention. And one of the coolest barn finds that we have is... <laughs> this is my dad's original 65 race car. Uh, we thought the car had been destroyed and had actually been burned up in a fire. I put a reward out. Somebody actually had seen the car. Uh, we were able to verify it with the VIN tag. And at the time that I put the reward out, I was actually already building a clone of the car because I had assumed it did not exist. And if you actually look closely on the car, you'll see the paint where you got orange here and then blue. And a lot of people didn't know, but dad actually had the car orange prior to going with what ended up becoming his iconic uh, white and blue scheme. And so that along with, obviously it had the VIN tag on it, so we knew that it was real. Uh, I've decided not to restore it. I want to leave it exactly as it is because if I were to restore the car, probably 10% of the car would be original. And that to me isn't, there's no point in doing that. That just doesn't make sense to me. And so you get this timeline of being able to see my dad's history of going 65. And then this is his real 67 car. Uh, a collector in Wisconsin had this who, you know, there were 17 of these factory four speed cars built and most of them had been accounted for, about 14 of them at the time that I had found this one. And luckily, um, the previous owner had collected a lot of the unique items that were made for uh, these cars. So the RO cars had around 50 unique options on it. He literally had gathered all of it, made the restoration of the car really pretty easy uh, compared to having to hunt down all this stuff. These cars weren't particularly successful. The 65 cars were very successful. These cars were very heavy. And then eventually in 68, they came out with the, what they call the LO cars, and those were extremely successful. Um, this is the clone of Dad's 65 car that I was doing. And I thought it was important for people to see that I would do the clone car. I think a lot of people would rip the badge off the original and just put it on this car and go, look, it's his original car. Um, that's not the way you do history. It shouldn't be done that way. So this is uh, a clone. It's done correctly, but it's not, you know, his original car. Bare bones in there. It's only got the one wiper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all done correct as to how the lightweight cars would have been. Magnesium intake on a clone or no? Uh, you know what? I can't remember, to be honest with this, because this was one of the early ones that I did. Uh, this car was originally, uh, when I purchased it, the guy had done it as a clone to the original cars, and it was all white. So I bought it, converted it to a four speed, and then put the blue over top of the white so that it would look you know, correct. And this gives us the opportunity to take a car somewhere. And once again, I'm not as concerned about somebody touching it. I can let people get super close to it, and, but I'm very transparent that it's not the real car. So I'm not trying to, you know, to mislead people. Uh, this one is one I'm known for because this took place on stage at Meekum. Uh, so a lot of people saw me buy this car. This car, when it was originally found, a lot of people thought it was Ronnie's uh, original 70 NHRA Pro Stock car. 
It is not. This is what they call the GT1 car. It was raced in um, AHRA, and it was actually meant to be a single four barrel class. So even though this has the 2-4 setup on it, this car originally would have been raced with a single, uh, a single four barrel on it. And Dad and Ronnie both shared uh, racing duties in this car, just depending on who was running what, because they would bring the whole, the whole team of cars to an AHRA race. So we have lots of documentation on the car. I had no intention of actually buying it. The auction estimate was, was very high on the car. And uh, next thing I know, I was on stage raising my hand. Dad was on top giving announcements for Meekum and had no idea that I'd bought the car. And so then he comes down and he's like, what's all the chaos? And I said, well, I just bought the car. Is and this the one that had a special intake to fit the single carburetor on Correct, it? yeah, we actually have one uh, all the way in the back. Uh, it was a Vanky intake. Okay. Uh, they made about 20 of those intakes from what I've been told. And the only reason we haven't converted it over, this car sounds so good, it idles perfect. I kind of just don't want to screw with it, <laughs> to be honest. And it's not going anywhere. You know, cars that my father have raced are, uh, you know, are not and will not be for sale. So, uh, yeah, it's not going to go anywhere. And so this, this makes it fun for taking it around. Sounds great. It's got obviously an iconic sound. And I'd much rather take this car out because these body panels are nice and solid compared to this car, which is dad's uh, 72 car built by hand by him. If you've watched the documentary, uh, we do a lot of profiling of this car and all of the special things uh, that go on with it. Like the, the only way we was, can- The floor was raised. Everything, and... floor raised. Uh, uh, the front fenders are two inches longer. The back end is two inches shorter. And there's a countless other things. Anywhere there could be a hole, there is a hole. Uh, you know, done to lighten the car up. Even the bolts were drilled through the center? Yep, it was rifle drilled, everything about it. It's really cool if you watch the documentary because we did a lot of video and pictures from underneath the car so you can see everything that was done. And what was hilarious when I first got the car, uh, I didn't realize the wheels were magnesium. So when I went to take off the front tire for something, I can't remember what I, why I did it, but I went to grab it and normally you kind of you know, brace yourself like, okay, I'm gonna pull a tire about did a backflip because you can hold that tire with two fingers because the magnesium, it doesn't, it doesn't weigh anything. You ever broken off a stud on a Mopar? <laughs> I have not. I oh, have okay. luckily, luckily, I have not. Luckily, I have not. I don't it, know if they'd be backwards on this car, but on some no, of these. No, on the earlier ones, yeah, you yeah. had left hand, right hand thread. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's, that's a fun one to learn as a kid, which I did on my 65 car originally. I, so, I did yeah. that too. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then the only other car we didn't really cover was yep. that 68 car, which is actually my favorite of all of his cars. In the sunlight, this car, the paint job looks absolutely amazing. Um, the car was owned by Randy Hopkins, who was racing in HRA. He had a 68 Dart. He just happened to strip the paint off in the 90s and realized it was dad's old car. And so he uh, actually had Eddie Wilbanks, who was the guy that originally painted the car in 1968 for dad. Dad got them together and Eddie Wilbanks repainted the car back in the original color scheme. Uh, and so I just, to me, driving this car around, I've taken it to Indy numerous times for the US Nationals, driving this car around in the pits, it just puts, it just raises the hair on my body, man. It's just such a cool experience, you know, driving the car around. And like I said, in the in the daylight, this thing just looks amazing. LO23 darts are just cool in general but I mean, this was a really winning car. Oh yeah, dad won about 70 to 75% of the races uh, in this car and he finished, I'm trying to remember the numbers. He either finished first or second in over 80%. We have all the, my mom kept a travel chart uh, at the time and would document you know, what his outcomes were on everything. Cause of course she was you know, keeping the books and making sure that this was a profitable thing that could pay the bills. And so she kept track of all that stuff. And that generation in general generally hoarded and kept, you know, everything. And so it's been awesome when we were doing the documentary to be able to go back through timeline everything and be able to have all the history, find magazine articles, you know, to tie up to it. If you haven't seen the documentary and you're into 60s era drag racing and into the 70s, there's a ton of stuff that's not just about that. It's about that era of racing in general. Tons of original footage, original pictures. It's really cool to be able to watch. So, but yeah, and then, so we did this setup and then I started buying signs and then it went crazy. And now I'm kind of known as the guy that if you're, you know, have a question about a Mopar sign or trying to sell a Mopar sign, uh, you know, this is where you come. And through collecting for this is how 
Jordan Richmond and I ended up starting Richmond Auctions, um, you know, I had such a passion for the history. And so being able to help other people build their collections, share the knowledge that, that I've gained, and then Jordan, of course, who's the best in the world at it, it's just really fun to, to work with people like that and learn all this crazy history of gas companies, oil companies, soda brands, you know, obviously the automobile stuff, which is more my wheelhouse. And uh, yeah, I'm always looking to find new pieces that I don't have, you know. People are like, oh, you've run out of room. I'm like, no way, man. There's still a lot of ceiling in here. And how can they so, get in contact with you? Uh, you can go to Facebook and see McCallum's collection. That's probably the easiest way to be able to do it. Uh, there's also through the auction house, Richmond Auctions, you can do that as well. We are set up to do private tours right now. I'm not set up on a normal cadence for here. Uh, we're working on a really big project that we hope to announce in about 45 days. Uh, and then after that, I'm hoping to have a normal, keep a normal schedule, but people can always contact us through there. We do our best to be able to meet. We're usually working in the front and people are allowed to walk through, take as many pictures as they want. And there's one more sign that you wanted to show me. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite signs in the, uh, in the museum because it's easy to walk by and have no idea, you know, what you were looking at. And so in here, this is just a history of dad sort of through a timeline. And then I put all the smalls that I find uh, through promotional stuff. Once again, sort of all, you know, pre-62 uh, inside of here and display them. But right as you come into the museum, you'll see this Maxwell sign. And people are like, why would a Chrysler Museum or a Mopar Museum have a Maxwell sign? Well, Maxwell was really the predecessor to what ended up becoming Chrysler. Walter Peak Chrysler ended up running Maxwell uh, as the CEO, and Maxwell was having all types of various uh, PR issues, some quality control issues. Chrysler was brought in to sort of save the company, and in 1925, as everybody saw the inevitable demise of Maxwell, Chrysler decided to put his name for only about a six month period of time in 1925 on Maxwell advertising. So every sign like this prior to 1925 would just say the good Maxwell with your dealer name listed. Midway through 25, he puts built by Walter P. Chrysler to take advantage of the advertising that was there because come 1926, Maxwell is now gone and it's actually called Chrysler. And that's the origin story of Chrysler. So this is the oldest Chrysler sign that is known to exist at this point because it's the transition year between it being Maxwell and it being Chrysler. And it's, it's absolutely one of my favorite signs because I, the person that had it knew that it needed to be here and I'm super appreciative uh, of them working with me because they know it's never going anywhere. So, Well, Mike, I want to thank you for your time. Yeah, man. I thank really you. appreciate you stopping by. I yeah. do. Yeah, man. Great stuff.